This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, so we've come a long way in, in two lectures. Um, the first lecture we looked at why, if you look at this particular special way of solving for finding n equals 1 vacuum or supersymmetric vacuum of a string theory, you end up looking at algebraic geometry, Calabi hours. And then in the last lecture, we developed a serious case of sequence fatigue, where we just spent all of our time going from one sequence to the other in an effort to show that you could actually compute stuff, that there was power in making this specialization, that you could actually compute quantities which on the face of it were very hard to compute. What we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to take a step back and do something different, and then at the end we'll come back to that kind of um, analysis and, and we'll, we'll do a final example bringing together what we've learned. So what are we going to do this lecture? Well, th there's a sort of theme of this school is using algebraic geometry and string theory. And, and what is algebraic geometry? Well, it's basically describing stuff with polynomial equations. So something that it would be very useful for us to have is a toolkit for actually properly manipulating polynomial equations in an efficient and powerful way. In particular, we'd like to do that on our computers, on our laptops. You know, you, know, you don't have to do everything by hand, because some of these problems get quite large. Or you may want to do a few thousand examples or something. So what we're going to look at in the first part of the lecture is just computational techniques in algebraic geometry, how you describe solutions of polynomial sets and so forth using an algorithmic approach. And we're going to do a lot of that from first principles. So we're just going to start with a set of polynomials and say how it works. So it's completely decoupled from what's gone so far, basically. We're going to show some examples of how you use these techniques in, in, in physics. These are called Grobner basis techniques. How you use these examples in physical problems, these techniques in physical problems. And then once we've done that, we're going to go back to the type of calculation that we were doing last time and do a, a fun last example. And in particular, um, Someone was saying, you know, I, I, at one point in some of the vast numbers of sequence chasings we did last, last lecture, I said, this thing is injective, right? If you look at this polynomial map more carefully, you'll see that it inje it's injective, its kernel is zero. Um, it's a bit dissatisfying because you've not really seen how that would come about. So in particular, we're going to be calculating a particular one of these maps to, to look at a particular physical effect. Um, and, and you know, we'll, we'll see a bit more of that structure using these computational techniques. So what we're going to talk about is Grobner bases. It's a new topic. OK, what's our starting point? So we start right at the beginning. We're going to take a polynomial ring. So what we're going to take is the, the infinite set of all polynomials and some variables with complex coefficients. We're going to split, split our set of variables into two pieces. So we're going to have a set of variables xa and a set of variables yi. So this is just it's a ring, but it's, if you like, it's just the infinite set of all polynomials in those variables. And what we're going to do is we're going to define an unambiguous monomial ordering on this set of polynomials. So we define... a monomial... So what do I mean by that? So a monomial ordering is just a way, so this, this is the set of all polynomials. In particular, it includes just individual monomials. And it's a way of unambiguously saying that, for example, x1 squared I take to be bigger than x1 times y2, which I take to be bigger, bigger than y1 times y3 times y100, y to the 898 is bigger than and so forth. So in other words, if I give you any two monomials, you can say this monomial is bigger than this one. So let me tell you a little bit about what I do mean and what I don't mean by this. I do not mean that there's some value for x and y such that if I plug in the numbers, x1 squared is numerically a larger number than x1 times y2. It's not what I mean. What I mean is there's a formal ordering. So I can say this is comes before in my ordering before this one. This one comes before this one, and I can do that unambiguously for any monomials. Why on earth would you want some, such a thing? Well, we're going to see that when we write out um, a, an algorithm on the next board. But 
we're going to need an extra property for our monomial ordering. And what we're going to say is this monomial ordering is going to have the elimination property with respect to x. So require the ordering, which I'll just denote by that, to have the elimination property. What is this? So an elimination property says if you have some polynomial in these variables, okay, and you look at the largest monomial in it according to this ordering. Right, a polynomial will have a finite number of monomials in it, so some are finite monomial, number of monomials. So one of them is going to be the largest one. So look at the largest monomial in the poly. If this largest monomial only depends on y and doesn't depend on x, then this ordering having an elimination property means that this would imply that P, the polynomial itself, only depends on y. So what do I mean? This sort of thing is an elimination property. Imagine you say that any monomial with an x in it is automatically bigger, in this sense, than anything that only contains y's. x always beats y to any power. Then we're saying if you have a polynomial whose biggest monomial in that ordering only depends on y, anything that contained x was to the, to the left of that was bigger. So if the leading monomial only contains y, so do all the others. And so this would be true. The polynomial itself would only be a function of y. So, do some dirty fingerprints on the board. Um, so that it means leading monomial. Okay. So the leading monomial of the polynomial, the biggest monomial according to our ordering, only depends on y. Means the entire thing does. Why on earth would you do such a thing? You would do such a thing because there is an algorithm called the Bookberger algorithm that allows you to take any set of polynomial equations that you're interested in and manipulate them into a more useful form. In fact, if you just have an ordering, but in particular a more useful form if we have an ordering that has this requirement. So let's have a look at this algorithm. This is the Bookberger algorithm. OK, we start with some set of polynomial equations that we're interested in. So in particular, I'm going to start Instead of putting equation equals zero, I'll just list the polynomials that I want to vanish. So I'm going to start with a set of polynomials, which I'll call G, and the individual polynomials I'll call PI. Okay. Algorithm goes like this. You start with your initial set. You choose a pair of polynomials in your initial set. Pi and Pj, say. And you form the following difference of them. You form something called an S polynomial, which is just a monomial P1 times the polynomial Pi minus a monomial P2 times the polynomial Pj, such that the leading terms here cancel. So in particular, such that P1, this guy, times the leading monomial, the biggest monomial according to our ordering of Pi, minus P2 times the leading monomial of Pj equals 0. Okay. You just choose the monomials P1 and P2 so that that's true. They, al they always can because, in particular, if I've got a leading monomial here, um, F, and a leading monomial here, G, if I take P1 to be G and G2 to be F, then I'll cancel ah, off FG. No, P1 and P2 are monomials. Mon okay. Right? Sorry, this is a, a pain to say. So these ones are monomials. Yeah. These ones are polynomials in your original set. Yeah. 
if I take P1 to be the leading monomial of Pj and P2 to be the leading monomial of Pi, then they'll automatically cancel. So it, it's always possible, but there may be a better choice. There may be a smaller choice which makes stuff faster. Okay, good. Okay, so we've got our S polynomial. What do we do with it? Next step in the algorithm is you reduce it with respect to G. What does that mean? S with respect to G. It just means you do polynomial long division with respect to this set of polynomials as much as you can. I can be more specific about that if people are interested, but you just do essentially, um, you subtract off monomial multiplications of this from this in order to cancel leading terms in the thing you subtracted off. You just do long division with respect to the polynomial to reduce S as much as possible. And you call the result H. You've now got two possibilities. You can either reduce H to zero, in which case you go to the next pair of polynomials and you just repeat the whole process. Or H isn't equal to zero. Those are the two logical possibilities. And if H isn't equal to zero, you add H to your set of polynomials G and you start again. So you just keep going. You form pairs, you form these differences. If it can't be cancelled down to zero, you add it back in, you just keep going. And this algorithm terminates, and it does terminate, when all S, all possible pairs, reduce to zero. Once you've done that, you have some final set of polynomials, which was your original set of polynomials with some of these H's added back in. So the final set of polynomials we'll call is GF, and this is a Grobner basis. OK, so I've got a new form of my polynomial equations. I've just done rearrangements of my polynomial equations in a particular way using this algorithm. Why is that a useful thing to have done? There are many reasons why, if you look in the math literature, why Grobner basis is a very useful thing to do. So for, just as a silly example, if you do long division by polynomials, in general, the result isn't unique. It depends what order you divide your polynomials out by. But for a Grobner basis, polynomial division is unique. And there's all these nice properties that you don't normally have. But we're just going to focus on one of them that's very easy to see. So a property of GF is the following. This new set of polynomials is the following. If you just take those polynomials in this new set, which only depend on Y, if you just take the polynomials that only depend on Y, then these are necessary, which I can never spell, and sufficient conditions on y, on the variables y, for an existent, for the existence of a, a solution to your original set of polynomials. Okay. So you start out with this big set of polynomial equations in multiple sets of variables. And when you form the, and you know, if you took just the um, polynomials that only depended on the y's in there, there may not even be any, but you, it, it wouldn't tell you anything. I mean, it, it's just some big intercoupled set of equations relating these different variables. If you take a Grobner basis like this, using such an ordering, if you take the Grobner basis and you only take out the equations for y, those are the constraints on y such that you had a solution. Why is that? Well, you can see that from this monomial ordering. What did this monomial ordering did? It said anything that's got an x in it is bigger than anything that has a y in it. That's just how I'm going to define it. And what did we just do in this, argument, in this algorithm? Every time we formed an s polynomial, we did our utmost to cancel off the leading terms in the polynomials we have. In other words, the things with x's in them. So if it's possible 
to take your initial set of equations and recombine them to cancel off the x's and just leave you something with the y's, then the statement is, is that this algorithm will do it for you. Okay. So what's the geometry? It's useful to have a geometry. Algebraically, it's kind of hard to see. I mean, you can understand the statement, but it's kind of hard to see what's going on. It's useful to have a geometric picture in your mind for what this actually corresponds to in terms of the solution set of the polynomial equation. So let's do this. So we have our, our variables, which are x, and then we've got some y's, say y1 and y2. Apologies for my 3D drawing. And our original set of equations has some set of solutions in terms of these variables. Now let's say the set of solutions looks like this, just some line through x and y space. So this is where g is equal to 0. What does this procedure correspond to? It corresponds to projection from the complete set of variables, space of variables, down to just the y plane. So if I take this guy and I project out the x coordinate, oops, and just project it onto the y plane, then the equations we get here, just the ones that depend on y, are the equations for this curve just in the y plane. Why is that this constraint? Well, if I'm anywhere on this curve, if I have any solution to these constraints, then somewhere above that curve in this space, there is a solution to the original set of polynomials. It's just projection. So what this allows you to do is take any set of equations you like, any set of equations that involves multiple variables, any polynomial set that you write down, and if there's a set of variables whose values you just simply don't care about, right, you want there to be a solution, but you don't care where the solution is in a certain set of variables, you can just eliminate them and get a set of equations instead for the variables you do care about. Okay. So I should have already turned this on, according to you. Did that do it? Did anything change? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at an example of this taken from the physics literature. So right back in lecture one, I said there was another way, there's several other ways, but there is one particular other way in which algebraic varieties come into discussions of string theory. So we've been talking about the actual physical space-time all this time. But another way in which algebraic varieties come in is through the vacuum space. So um, the field space of any n equals 1 theory is a Kähler manifold. And you can ask, for example, what's the supersymmetric vacuum space of an n equals 1 theory that's Minkowski? if I have uncharged fields. And the equations are as follows. You have something called a superpotential, which is just, if you're doing some supersymmetric perturbative thing, is just a polynomial in the fields. And the equations for a supersymmetric vacuum space are w equals 0, and the derivative of w with respect to all of the fields is 0 as well. This is a set of polynomial equations in a, basically in flat space, in this case, roughly. And that means that this is an algebraic variety. It's just a set of polynomial equations, so we can use our methods to describe it. Oh, I've got to get all the boards down. So let's have a look at an example of that taken from a paper, which is now quite old because I've been using this example for a while, by uh, Shelton et al. in this H HEPTH number. Now, the exact example they're doing doesn't matter. It's actually something quite funky. It's um, a manifold that's patched together with T-dualities and things. It's a really quite complicated, stringy, putative, stringy kind of dimensional reduction. And this, the idea is, is that when you did a dimensional reduction, if you were able to do a dimensional reduction on such a space, they argue that this is the superpotential you'd get. And it looks like a mess, but there actually isn't too much here. So the fields are S, U, and tau. And that's it. Right? So the only fields in this theory are complex fields, S, U, and tau. And everything else on the board is one of the parameters describing their extra-dimensional setup. Right, so they're all basically integer parameters. Right? And as you can see, kind of the point of their paper was you can get a lot of them. Right? And they can get more than anybody else by looking at these complicated constructions. So we have all of these parameters, A0, A1, A2, A3, B0, C, check, C, hat. And they work out some consistency conditions that if this theory is going to come from one of these dimensional reductions, 
that this theory has to obey. And these consistency conditions on these parameters, which comes from sort of physics like I want the total charge for anything on a compact space to add up to zero, this kind of thing. These consistency conditions are written here. In fact, this is about half of them, because if you swap the hats and the checks on the Cs, then th those are also conditions. And you can see that this is a rather nasty set of polynomial that you may want to play with. So m what might you want to ask about this system that isn't immediately obvious? What I might ask is, if I form these equations, so let me write it up here. If I look at w equals 0 and dw equals 0, so I'd have to do w with respect, dw with respect to s, t, and of tau, and u. I may ask, when can I solve these equations with this system? And for what parameters, which of these different parameters obeying these constraints does a supersymmetric vacuum like this exist? Right? It's a reasonable question. And if you look at it, it's not entirely obvious. right? You don't <coughs> see just from playing with that how you're going to find a solution. Nevertheless, it is obvious how to work it out because we just found that out. We just got told that if I form a Grobner basis of our polynomial equations, um, then... There's some variables I don't care about. I just I don't care about what values of st and u I get for the second. I just want to know what constraints on the parameters are there such that a solution exists. Um, so what I can do is I can just form the equations, eliminate the variables I don't care about, and get the constraints on the remaining variables, the parameters in this case. So here's their w programmed in. Here are their variables, s, t, and u, and then I'm just taking the derivative of w with respect to those, so that's these two equations. Here is their constraints that they had in their paper that we had up on the slide. I do not guarantee that I type these incorrectly, but it doesn't matter correctly, but it doesn't matter for the point of view of this, this demonstration. I could have made a minus sign somewhere, but I think it's okay. And then we're just going to do this elimination. Um, so we're literally going to run the algorithm that we had up on the board. We're just going to run it on the computer. Now, okay, so let me just, this is just me getting it in the right input form, and now we're going to run it. Let me check, I don't have a window open. No, good. Um, when I run this, an extra window is going to pop up, and in it is going to be the protocol of a program called Singular that we'll talk about in a minute, running this algorithm. And there's going to be lots of little pieces, so we need to know what they are so we know what we're looking at. So if I just ran the Bookberger algorithm, as I showed it to you there, it would work, but it would take about a million years. And that's because this is a very big process. You have to form lots of pairs of polynomials. You have to figure out lots of stuff, and it's very, very slow. The trick in getting this to work well is figuring out which S polynomials, which pairs you really need to consider. And it turns out people got all these clever tricks for saying, actually, that one is guaranteed to reduce to zero, so I never need to consider it in the first place. That pair of polynomials automatically cancel. I don't need to consider it. So when we run this, there's going to be a big protocol, which I'll describe as it's going up. And then at the end, there'll be something that says product criterion and chain criterion. And that's the computer showing off and telling you how clever it was at ignoring S polynomials. So let's run it, hope that it's working today, and see what happens. Eventually, please open a window. Thank you. OK, so the numbers that are rushing past are the numbers of S polynomials that it's considering. The dash is, is the computer saying I'm a happy llama because it's managed to cancel an S polynomial to zero. The dots are the computer being clever and saying that S polynomial looks really hard, so I'm going to ignore it for now. I'll come back to it later. Um, 23 there that's not in a bracket is the current degree of the polynomials it's looking at. Keeps going. Eventually, it's going to count down. We're nearly there because it says 55 polynomials remaining. Done. And it's saying it's been really clever and ignored lots of stuff. So what do we end up with? Let me see if I can raise it up a bit. We end up with this set of polynomials, which you'll see only depend on the parameters. This is the necessary and sufficient set of conditions on those parameters for there to exist a supersymmetric Minkowski vacuum. And we didn't have to do anything. I just used a prepackaged mo module to run it. Now, you may say, hey, they're pretty complicated as integer valued equations. You're never going to solve those, so why do I care? Well, first of all, there's some very simple polynomials here. C tilde 2 has to be 0 if you want one of these vacua to exist. They had this, this parameter coming from their dimensional reduction, so they know wherever that parameter came from in their dimensional reduction, if that piece of structure is there in the extra dimensions, then there are no Minkowski vacua. And they learned that without any work on their part at all, because you just plug it into the machine. But even more than that, say that you were 
not wanting to use any of the other polynomial methods we're going to look at, and you just wanted to numerically solve stuff. So you take these equations and you look numerically for solutions, n solve in Mathematica or something, and you step through integer values for the parameters looking for a solution for st and u each time. A more efficient way to do that would be to run this computation first, and each time you choose a, a, a certain set of parameters that you're going to run your, your numerical solver for, just plug it in here. If this gives you zero, you know your numerical solver should find something. If these equations are not satisfied by your choice of parameters, there's no point even turning the numerical solver on because no such vacuum exists. Okay. So this is an incredibly powerful way of, so I can turn this back off again, of getting, um, of getting um, poly polynomial man manipulations um, to give you a result that you're interested in. Okay, I seem to be going quite fast. There are many other tools. Many, this is computational com commutative algebra, basically. And this field has many, many other tools that we can use. Um, and you can understand many of them just in terms of the technique we already have. So, in particular, something that's going to be useful to us is something called splitting principles. And do ask questions, by the way. OK. So other ways of manipulating polynomial equations. What's a splitting, a splitting principle, a splitting tool? OK. So I'm going to write up some stuff, and then I'm going to explain what it is. So a splitting tool says the following. Well, one particular example of a splitting tool text says the following. Uh, union. Okay, what does this mean? This is gobbledygook. So if I write something in triangular backets like this, I mean a set of polynomials, basically. So I here is some set of polynomials that's my polynomial equation. So what I had is G before, I guess. L of I means the set of solutions over the complex numbers to that set of polynomials. Okay. So this is just the solution set of the set of polynomials i. What this says is that this set of, uh, this set of solutions to i is the set of solutions to i where f is also 0. So f is just some other polynomial. I just choose a polynomial in addition to my original equations. So the set of solutions to my original set of equations is the set of solutions where f is equal to 0 plus an extra bit. Um, what is this extra bit? Well, i f infinity is called a saturation. And roughly speaking, what l of i of f of infinity is, is the points in i the solutions to i such that the polynomial f is not equal to 0. And now this really makes some sense. Right? Take any set of polynomial equations. They have some solutions. Pick any polynomial you like. The set of solutions to i is the set where f is equal to 0 plus the set where f is not equal to 0. It's not rocket science. In fact, there's a caveat here. This set of points is actually the algebraic closure of the set of points where f is 0. But this is a subtlety that's not going to be important for us today. f is not 0, so it's not going to be important. OK, so what we want to do is take our original set of polynomial equations and split it up into two sets of equations, this one and this one. And one of those is very easy to get. So the equations for the first piece, let's go over here. It's trivial to get because I get them just by adding f to my set of equations. So, so this thing is trivial to get. What about 
this more complicated object, the saturation. This on the surface of it looks much harder because it's very easy to get a set of inequalities for this. It's I equals zero, F not equal to zero, roughly. But it seems harder to get a set of equalities, which are easier to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. We prefer dealing with equations. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do this by considering the following. Consider the following set of polynomials. So we have our original set, I. We introduce an extra dummy variable, which I'll call T, times F minus 1. So this is an extra polynomial I'm adding in, t times f minus 1. And consider, uh, and this is an element of this ring. So it's a, a polynomial system in x, y, and t. Where do these equations have a solution and where do they not? Where are these 0 and where are they not? So these equations have a solution. If and only if i equals 0, so your original set of polynomial equations is solved, and f is not equal to 0. Why is that? Well, if f is 0, this polynomial equation would become minus 1 equals 0, which doesn't have any solutions. If f is not equal to 0, this automatically has a solution, t is 1 over f. So this set of equations has exactly the form we want. Right? It's the set of equations which has a solution if i is solved and f is not equal to 0. The only problem with it is it has one extra variable. I've just put in this dummy variable and made something up that wasn't in the original problem, t. So what do we do now? Well, we get rid of t. By elimination. We've just developed a technique to remove any unwanted variable that we don't like the look of from a, from a problem. We use this Grobner basis elimination algorithm. So then if we form this quantity, we just form the Grobner basis of our set of po polynomial equations, and we intersect the result. In fact, we take the polynomials in the result that only depend on x and y. Those are the necessary and sufficient constraints on your original variables for i to have a solution and f not to have a solution. Okay. So this is the saturation. And this is an incredibly useful tool. So, wow, am I going fast? Um, so you can split up your varieties into smaller pieces like this. Uh, and if you choose a, a wise choice of, of this, this polynomial, you can really break up one set of equations that's describing one really big complicated object into two smaller sets that, would that describe pieces of what you originally had. You may want to go further. You may want to do something called primary decomposition. So primary decomposition is actually... Um, a bit of a stronger thing than we need, but that's what the algorithms tend to be called, so we're going we're gonna to call it that. So. so what does primary decomposition do? In a sort of classical viewpoint, anyway. It splits up a variety. You give it any equation, so it splits up your algebraic variety. into its irreducible parts. OK, so what do I mean by that? So say that your solution set for your algebraic variety looks like this. I've got a line here of solutions, another line here, a point here. That'll do. Right. This algebraic variety actually has three pieces. It has that one, that one, and that one. And the original set of equations, the idea is, would describe all three at once. There's these three different solution sets to this one set of equations. If you gave that set of equations to a primary decomposition routine, what it would do is it would return one set of equations describing just this bit, one set of equations describing just this bit, and one set of equations just describing our point here. This is useful because quite often, as we'll see in an example in a minute, you're not interested in all of these solutions. 
maybe, I don't know, maybe you want a supersymmetric solution, or maybe you want a Minkowski solution, and, and this one and this one aren't Minkowski, and this one is. Or maybe you want to stabilize all moduli, so you want a solution that is dimension zero, is just a point. You could throw away the bits of the equations describing this piece and just keep the equations describing this. So primary decomposition is a useful thing. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how you do a primary decomposition algorithm, except to say that there's many different ways. One way is called the GTZ algorithm, and it's based exactly that's lucky, on that splitting tool. So what GTZ primary decomposition does is it applies this splitting tool multiple times, but it's really clever about choosing which f. It sort of automatically works out which f will be useful for splitting the thing up. Um, yeah. So primary decomposition, another, another tool we have in our toolkit. The final thing I'll mention quickly, just because it's just so useful, is you can also work out the dimension of an ideal or just set of polynomials um, from a Grobner basis. If you have a Grobner basis, it's, it's, you just look at the leading monomials in the Grobner basis, and it's just a combinatorical problem to work out what the dimension of an ideal, uh, uh, dimension of an ideal is. And if you have something like this that has multiple pieces, the dimension of it is regarded as the biggest dimensional piece. So here it would be one-dimensional, even though there's points. So there's all these useful techniques and useful um, programs out there which, fortunately, we can use for free. So this is not some in principle branch of mathematics that says this algorithm exists, we can prove that it would finish in finite time, but no one's actually programmed it in in a nice way. All of these algorithms, primary decomposition, dimension, and many others, have been implemented in an extremely efficient way by a number of different mathematics groups who release their program as just free stuff you can download from their website and just use. And we've, we've seen an example already. This program I used earlier was one of these free programs. So there are many different things on the market. I'm just going to tell you two of the ones that are commonly used in physics and give you the website so you can go and have a look and see if there's anything useful for you. So here are the programs. The first program I'm going to tell you about is something called Macaulay 2. So this is written largely, I think, by Dan Grayson and Mike Stillman. And it can be found at this website. And I'm sure we can put this up on the web page. If, uh, if you want it. UIUC edgy. Macaulay 2. And what Macaulay 2 is, is once you know a little bit of terminology, like you know what a sheaf is and things like this. It's a very comfortable program to be working with. You don't have to define, you know, an ideal and then, sh you know, work, uh, sorry, a ring and then sheafify it. Or you don't have to know lots of mathematics to use it. So, for example, if you give it a sheaf, you can just say to Macaulay to work out the cohomology. Right? So then you don't have to do all this stuff with the sequences. The trouble with it is, is that tends to be very slow, so the sequences tend to be faster. But nevertheless, it's a very, it got lots of very nice high-level functions, and the Grobner basis algorithm in it is very highly optimized. It's very fast, ma many, many times faster than Mathematica. If you try this in Mathematica, often it will just grind to a halt. It's getting better, though. The other program I'm going to tell you about is one called Singular. This is the one we just saw running. And this is available at this website. Singular dot uni dot Deutsch. It's a German program. And um, Singular, very similar kind of deal. Um, its language is much more based around commutative algebra. Um, it's very typecast language. It's sometimes slightly counterintuitive when you're starting to use it, but it's, it's a very nicely constructed, very logical program. And the thing about Singular is it's really fast. I mean, Macaulay 2 is fast, Singular is a little bit faster again. So if you've got a really big system and you just want something that's going to get the job done, this is the guy. It doesn't have some of these nice high-level functions. It has others instead, but for us it doesn't have all the nice high-level functions we would want. But it, it's just so fast, it's, it's a wonderful thing to use. It's a lovely tool. So for example, if you look in Singular, 
there is a, a module called primdec gtz. If you do primdec gtz and then your equations, it will do your primary decomposition for you, just like using Mathematica. So these are very nice tools to be able to have, and you may say, ha, huh, polynomial equations are now no, no obstruction to me. In the future, everything is easy. I just plug it into the program, ask it to give me an answer, and I never have to worry about solving a polynomial equation properly again. The problem with it is, is that there is a drawback, as always, and the drawback is the limitation of these methods and how big a thing they can deal with. So we just saw with an example that was actually reasonably big that they can do interesting problems, but they do have serious limitations. The limitation um, that is the most serious about these methods is they have very bad scaling with the size of the problem. Not necessarily a problem if, you're, if, if your system finishes. But as you start to raise the size, sooner or later it will just grind to a halt. I'm going to quote a result which I always hesitate before quoting because it's an upper bound, it's a worst case scenario. And in my experience, this is nothing, it's nothing like as bad as what I'm going to put up. But I just want to write a formula to give you an idea. So there's a, a paper by Muller and Mora from 1984, where they prove that an upper bound on the degree of the polynomials in what's called a reduced Grobner basis. So this is just the same thing that we generated. But you take the Grobner basis and then you do long division of the set with respect to itself to get it as small as possible. So this is the degree of the polynomials in your final set after you've run this algorithm. And they pointed out that this thing is less than or equal to, if you like, 2 times d is going to be the degree of our original set of polynomials. So d squared over 2 plus d. Hey, not looking so bad so far. But then if n is the number of variables, this is to the power of 2 to the power of n minus 1. That's bad. So you can imagine that if I have a large n and I start raising the degree, I'm going to have trouble quickly. If I have a, a certain degree and I start raising n, life is going to become hard very, very soon. So these, these, um, these calculations scale very badly. And you know, there's not really much point in trying to throw extra computer resources at something that doesn't finish or something like that. Because the chances are, if the thing isn't finishing, it's so far beyond your computational ca capability that that you don't need to try. So as we've seen, interesting things can, can finish anyway, and we don't really care. We're going to do another example in a minute. But you have to bear this in mind, and in particular it makes, when you're doing a practical calculation in one of these subjects, it makes something that's a very important point there even more important, which is order of operations. When we looked at vector bundles in the last lecture, I said, well, I said right at the start that if you want it to be a solution, if you want it to correspond to a supersymmetric thing, it better be polystable. And then I completely ignored that, and I started working out the spectrum of the vector bundle instead. Why would you do such a thing? Well, it's incredibly quick and easy, by comparison, to work out the spectrum of the vector bundle, and incredibly hard and long-winded and boring to prove the stability. So say you were looking for standard models. Why on earth would you prove the stability of, say, 10 to the 12 vector bundles? and then figure out which ones had a nice spectrum. Why not do the quick thing first? You work out which ones look like the standard model, and then you see which of those are actually polystable. And this turns out to be really important. Anything that you can do, particularly with just integer multi uh, manipulations, like we did for the Chern class of the Club Yao, you do first. You get all the quick stuff out of the way. And when you've got no other choice, then you come back to these methods. But nevertheless, it's an incredibly useful tool. <coughs> OK, so let's have a look at a. One last example, which is going to take these tools and then use it in this type of context that we've been talking about all along, vector bundles over Calabi and in particular working out spectra of stuff. Not too many sequences, I promise. Of course, having said that, the first thing I'm going to write on the board is a sequence. But anyway, the, the thing we're going to work out is an example with what's called jumping spectra. So we're going to look at something that has a certain physical phenomenon called jumping spectra. What we're going to do is we're going to look at one of our vector bundles over one of our Calabi-Aus. Our calabi is going to be our old friend, the 2, 3, 3. 
Okay, so we've got one equation, product of projective spaces, two of them, so any line bundle is defined by two integers. Okay. We're going to define our bundle by a short exact sequence, just defining our bundle out of the line bundles, and I've chosen a specific one, 3 minus 3. Remember, these integers tell you what the first churn class of the line bundle is, and that's enough to specify it. This bundle is holomorphic, and I should thank Lara because over the weekend I was proving the stability of this and I ran out of steam because I ran out of time, and she finished off the higher ranks, which is the hard bit for me. So this is also polystable, at least in parts of the Kähler cone. So this is a good heterotic vacuum. This is an SU4 bundle, and everything's well behaved. It gives you an honest to God solution of the theory. We're going to follow the same procedure as we've been doing to get, um, ha ah, I just realized I've got the wrong numbers here. Let me look on the computer. I had another example earlier, and uh, I did the lecture with that example in, and then I realized that it was completely unstable. Not that it matters for this, but just as a matter of pride, I wanted to, to find a proper one. Um, and I've got the wrong numbers in my notes, but I've got the right one on the computer, I think. So what we can do, is we're going to work out the cohomology of the line bundles and then use that with the long exact sequence in cohomology that goes with this to work out the cohomology of V. And then we're going to use our techniques. So what are these cohomologies? I'm not going to go through the whole thing again. You write down the result in the ambient space, the causal, blah. So this is the answer you get. First of all, for this line bundle 3-1, you find that it has 30 sections, so H0 is 30 dimensional, and it has no other cohomology on the club yeah. Okay. You can look at this line bundle 01, 0, 01, and that has three sections, three, yeah, sections, and there's four of them, and it has nothing else. So we also have this bundle in here. And I'm going to draw the cohomology of this thing, the dimensions, as something a little bit strange. It definitely has no H0, so that's definitely 0. It definitely has no H3, so that's 0. But I'm going to put a question mark in here. If you go through, we'll see this in a second, if you go through the procedure of working out the cohomology of these line bundles that we had in the last lecture, it doesn't tell you straight away what this cohomology is. So what's the cohomology of V? Well, as always, turns out this map's injective. That's not the interesting one, so just believe me on that. So this is zero. Again, that's actually a requirement for stability. The first and second cohomologies we'll talk about in a second. The third cohomology is sandwiched between two zeros, so that's zero. So this just has an H1 and an H2. And the thing we're interested in is the H1, because H1 of V tells us the number of gut families of this model. That's what we worked out. So what's H1 of V? Well, if you do your usual sequence thingy, you find that it's 30 minus 12, 18, plus whatever this question mark is. And H2 is just whatever this question mark is. OK. So we have 18 plus question mark families of gut, uh, so gut families, families of standard model particles in this, in this model. Why am I writing a question mark? Why don't I just work the thing out? Well, let's have a look at that. And that's where this physics of jumping spectra, jumping particle number is going to come in. So how do I work out the cohomology of a line bundle? How do I work out these question marks? Well, I use this causal sequence, which relates the ambient space line bundle cohomology to that on the Club Yao. And in this case, it looks like this. An OX, am I doing this the wrong way around again?
Um, OX is the thing we want, two ambient space line bundles. We know all of the ambient space line bundle cohomology from these results um, in Hartshorn that I just quoted at you. If you look at what they are, this is zero. So we have H naught as usual, H1, H2, and H3. That'll do. We have zero for H naught, zero for H1. We have, and I'm going to write them as polynomials, we have one over cubic polynomials, if you use the results from the previous lecture, in H2. So the set of all one over cubic polynomials is the cohomology. And then you get zeros again. How about for the other ambient space guy? Well, here you get 0, 0, y cubed. So these are 1 over polynomials in the homogeneous coordinates of the first P2. Now we get actual cubic polynomials, y cubed, in the coordinates of the second P2. So the space of those is this cohomology. It's H2, yeah, um, H2 of O3 minus 3. And then we get zeros again. And this is the guy we want. This is the thing whose cohomology we want. Now, it's zero if cohomology is sandwiched between two zeros, so that vanishes. But then things get interesting. There's some map here. Let's call it F. What appears here is the kernel of that map by exactness, and what here appears here is its co-kernel, the image, uh, the target over the image. And the others are zero because they're sandwiched between zeros again. So H1 of OX3 minus 3 is determined by the kernel of one of these maps. And I, up till now, I've often told you that if we have a map like that, the, the, the thing is injective, and you can just work it out. But here, that's not necessarily true. And this kernel is H2 of OX3 minus 3. So these two things are the question marks that appear here. OK, so sorry? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm, yeah. So here it would be the dimension, absolutely, because here we were just counting dimensions. Here I've actually, these should be capital H's. I've actually put the cohomology groups as polynomials here. So here I should say that the kernel of F is H1, the co kernel of F. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just use 1 over X as the variable, and then write a cubic polynomial in that. You don't actually have to think about what the solution set of this is or anything. It's just a, 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 a formal tool. OK, so what's the answer? If I take the space of 1 over x cubes and I map it into the space of y cubes, what's the kernel? Well, it depends on the map. Right? If I take a completely general map between these spaces, you'll find out that both the kernel and the co-kernel vanish. That's essentially because... This is a space of 1 over cubics, and this is a space of cubics. So they're the same dimension. Right? And so if you take a general map, it sort of tends to be an isomorphism between them. It tends to be subjective, tends to be injective. But if you make a very special choice of map, that won't be true anymore. Right? For very special choices of map, then that could change. So if the map was 0, then this would be the space of 1 over x polynomials, and this would be the space of, of y cubed polynomials. So the number of 16s, the number of gut families in our model, depends on a choice of map. So we need to know what the map is. OK, so I never proved to you the causal sequence. So proving to you what the map in the causal sequence is is going to be hard, but I can at least motivate it. What is this thing? This is the causal sequence that describes how things on the ambient space get related to things on the Calabi Yau. And here's our ambient space, here's our Calabi-Yau. That's the only information that goes into the causal sequence, how this is embedded in this. What kind of polynomial is appearing in this map? Well, I have a polynomial that write, maps a space that's 1 over x cubed in degree in the coordinates of the first P2 to something that's degree 3 in the coordinates of the second P2. So F has degree... 3, 3. It's a bicubic polynomial. So what we need for this map is a bicubic polynomial that somehow describes how the 
the Kalabi Yau is embedded in the ambient space, and there's a fairly obvious choice. There's the one that defined the Kalabi Yau in the first place. And if you work through the definition of the causal sequence, I guess, and, and check this all out, you find that this is true. F is equal to the defining polynomial. of the Calabi L. Okay. Why is that interesting? Yeah, okay. In fact, we're going to see an example on the computer in a minute. But for example, um, what this would be is it would be a bicubic polynomial. I'm not going to write out every possible one, but this would be something like x naught cubed y naught cubed plus, say, 2 times x naught squared x1, y naught y1 squared plus. Right? It's the actual polynomial whose zero locus tells you where the Calabi Yau is in the ambient space. We will see a general one, relatively general one, in a minute. The interesting thing about that is this polynomial has coefficients in it, say, a1, a2. There's lots of different polynomials, and you can vary them. And I told you in the first lecture, and we saw a little bit yesterday in the second lecture, that what these things are is they're a description of the complex structure of the calabi yau threefold. They're moduli. As you change the coefficients, you change to the defining polynomial, the calabi yau moves around in the ambient space. But that's changing this map. And what you get for the kernel, how many gut families you get, depends <laughs> on this map. So as you change the complex structure of the Calabi Yau, as it moves through the ambient space, the number of massless 16 families of the standard model is going to change, which is a pretty amazing thing. Physically, how is this possible? How can the number of states change, right? Things don't really jump in physics like that. Well, the reason that it looks like there's this jumping change that the kernel can change, say, from 0 to 1, is because what the cohomology counts is the precisely massless particles. And one of those could gain or lose a mass. So physically what's going on is the following. So physically, imagine you had a superpotential, and I'm just making up a toy example to illustrate the, the idea, where phi 1 was a 16 of SO10, this is an anti-generation 16 bar, and this is, say, a complex structure modulus. If you work out the scalar potential from the, the equation G2 in Wessenbagger, you know, the usual equation for how you compute the scalar potential of a supersymmetric theory from a superpotential. It contains a term which, up to factors, looks like that. And if I look at what that looks like, that looks like mod z squared mod phi 1 squared. This is a mass term for phi 1, which only goes to 0 at a very special point in complex structure moduli space in my silly toy example where z equals 0. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing an effect where extra particles can be massless at certain points in the moduli space of the theory. And the cool thing is, is we're going to be able to describe exactly where. That's going to be our last example. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to use our kernels and our co-kernels and whatnot, and we're just going to calculate where does the kernel jump? For what values of the map, for what values of the complex structure does the particle content, the massless particle content of the theory change? So how do we do that? Well, this is what we're going to do on the computer now. So, in fact, I'll turn that on and then uh, we'll uh, just set it up. And then once the computer's ready, we'll... So what we do is we take a general element of the source. So take a source element. Now, the source is this 1 over cubic polynomials. So I can just do that as a sum over some coefficients. I call them Bm short for bundle moduli, which is a bit of a misnomer, but anyway, times each of the cubic, one over cubic monomials. Just make a general expansion in the basis of such things. How about a map? Well, we can do the same thing for a map. We can take our bicubic defining polynomial, and we can just expand it in terms of a basis of cubic monomials, bicubic monomials. So general coefficient, general monomial of the right degree. What's the kernel? What's this cohomology we're after? The kernel is, if I take an element of the source and I multiply it by the map, 
to hit the target, the kernel is the S such that that equals zero. Okay. So that's what a kernel is by definition. But we mean zero in the target space, not just zero in general. And zero in the target space here is zero in H2 of O minus 3, 3, which was the set of zero, 3 polynomials. So you can just work this out. You take your general element of the source, you map it to the target, you'll get um, some 0, 3 polynomial, and you can take the coefficient of each 0, 3 monomial to get a set of vanishing relations that you need for this thing to be in the kernel. And what you get when you do that is you get a set of bilinear relations in CS and BM. So this thing is expanded in terms of CS, so that will be the linear in CS, and this thing is expanded in terms of BM, so it will be linear in BM. Okay. So what does this set of relations mean? What's it actually describing? Well, let me do a trivial toy example of this before we do the full thing on the computer. So say there was just one of each, so we had BM times CS equals zero. This is a completely unphysical example, but we're just going to think about the equations like this for a second. So, yep. So the kernel of this map. So we have the cohomology that we want that determines the number of 16s is the kernel of the map between this space and this space. What I've done is I've taken a general element of the source, that's S. I've applied the mapping, and I've got a set of constraints on these expansion coefficients such that I get zero, such that my original source element was in the kernel. Here you get H2, because these are both H2s. I've got H0, H1, H2. The kernel is H1, because it's one step up. Good question. Okay. What do these relations describe physically? Well, imagine they just look simple like this. What would this mean? It would mean if CS was zero, BM is allowed to be in the kernel. It can be anything and still be in the kernel. That would mean that BM was one of these allowed 16 gut families, and it was massless, so I could give it a BEV. Okay. So if CS is zero, I can give this thing a BEV, and this is sort of the equation for telling you when you're allowed to do that. If BM was zero, I could give CS a BEV. That's just saying, this is the thing that becomes massive when I go away from CS is equal to zero. If it doesn't have a VEV, I can change CS from zero, and I won't be making this thing massive, driving myself up a potential wall. So what this actually is, roughly speaking, what these are, is in this weird BMCS space, it's the equations for the vacuum. And what we're going to do is we're just going to calculate that. We're going to work out the equations for the vacuum. We're going to use some of our polynomial techniques that we've learned, and then we're going to work out for what values of the complex structure this thing jumps. The kernel is not just zero. We'll choose an example of one of those putative complex structures that we'd have worked out with our method. We'll check that the kernel is indeed non-zero, and then we'll check how big it is. So we've then seen this jumping phenomenon. Okay, so let me just... Uh, Get rid of my dirty laundry off the screen. OK. So we know, so this is exactly the calculation we're going to do. I'm going to go through it again as we're doing it. So we need this source element, this 1 over cubic polynomial that's expanded in some basis. And there it is. Please tell me it's 1 over cubic. Yeah. And here is a bicubic polynomial. So this is a defining relation for the Calabi-Yau with some coefficients in it. So I should explain what all this is. So first of all, x11 is a homogeneous coordinate, the first homogeneous coordinate on the first P2. x12 is the second homogeneous coordinate and so on the first P2 and so forth. x21 is the first homogeneous coordinate on the second P2. Right, so these are just your, your variables. I've expanded the defining relation for the Calabi-Yau, the map in our sequence, 
in terms of a basis here, and here are my CSs, these expansion parameters. Okay. So that's this thing. And then I've done the same thing for this source space, these 1 over cubics, and that's at the top. Now, you may be say, thinking, hey, there are more 1 over cubics than that. You've cut some out. You're cheating. And that's exactly right. I am cheating. So if you try and run this for a Grobner basis, what I'm about to do for a Grobner basis with the full thing in, you would find that it takes a very long time to finish, and I didn't want to do that in the lecture. So I am cheating, and all I've done is I've just taken some of the variables and not all of them. However, e this actually physically has a meaning because I've done it in a certain way. So this isn't part of the main structure, but just to tell you you can do this. What I've done is I've taken our original Kalar Biao and I've quotiented it. So this Kalar Biao um, emits a freely acting Z3, Z3 symmetry, which you can quotient the Kalar Biao by and get a different Kalar Biao. When you do that, that symmetry only holds for certain defining polynomials, these ones. And the gauge fields and their properties also have to respect the symmetry, or you can't do the quotient. Only a limited set of gauge fields expect the symmetry, so you only get a limited set of gauge field cohomologies, and that's those. So this is a subject called equivariance. So you can either think of it as I'm cheating and leaving out some of the variables, or you can think of it as quotienting. Yeah? Does freely acting Z3 do? Mm -hmm. Z3, Z3. Yeah. Z3, Z3. Uh, does this work as shift, act as shifts on the polynomial? So the way it works. This is a bit out, out of the, we can just think of it as ignoring some variables, but the way it works is if you take, am I doing Z3, Z3, or just a single Z3? I'm just doing a single Z3, I lied. Sorry, you were right. So the way it works is if you take the coordinates, say, of the first P1, the homogeneous coordinates, X, I'm only going to do this for about five seconds, so it's probably okay. Um, the symmetry acts by multiplying them to, as e to the 2 pi i over 3, uh, let me call that A, times A, XA. That's the action of the symmetry. So if you have this action on the symmetry, uh, on, and there's a similar action on the, the homogeneous coordinates of the second P2, if you choose this defining relation, you will find that this maps points on the Kalabi out to points on the Kalabi out without ever mapping a point to itself. So there are no singularities. It's just a way of getting a new Kalabi out. It's just a way of reducing degrees of freedom. It's not something I want to. And is it true for every Kalabi the number of symmetries on, on these Kalabi owls is actually rather restricted. Um, fortunately for this set of Kalabi owls, a clever bunny by the name of Volker Braun has worked out all of the symmetries that can be written in a nice way in terms of the ambient space coordinates like this. So they're completely classified for this set of Kalabi owls. But they're actually rather rare. And if I wrote this one, for example, very similar looking manifold, but that one has no symmetries at all. So let's not get caught up on it. Let's just say I cheated and removed some variables. <laughs> OK, so we have to do this multiplication. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our source element, multiply it by the map, ask for it to be 0, and ask what constraints we get on what I've probably already rubbed out, which were these expansion coefficients CS and BM. So let's do that. And here they are. And you see that they're bilinear. Right, they're linear in BM, and they're linear in the complex structure because we're just multiplying the source by the map, and both of those were linear. OK, so we want to analyze. This is, in some sense, the equations for the vacuum space, and we want to analyze these. How are we going to do that? Well, there's one solution in this whole thing that is really boring. Right? It's clear from these equations that if I set all of the BMs to 0, is that the one I want to say? If I set all of the BMs to 0, then I can have any CS and it's going to be a solution because it's bilinear. Right. That's not the interesting thing. That's saying that for a general complex structure, this map will be general and there won't be any non-trivial solutions for the BMs. That's the one where the cohomology is zero. There are no 16 families. What we want to know is, are there other solutions in this set that are more interesting? Are there solutions where I can have a non-zero BM and a non-zero CS? How are we going to find that? Well, we're just going to apply primary decomposition and split up the different types of solution and pick the one we want. So how do we do that? Well, we form our, we just put the thing in the right input form. And then we do another one of, let's close the window so it pops up again in the cool fashion. Um, then we do another one of our Grobner basis calculations and do one of these primary decompositions. 
And if I run everything, there we are. So you can see this is quite sm uh, quite quick, so it finished rather soon. So we've got two types of solution in the primary decomposition. The first one is the boring solution. If you set all the BMs to zero, then there's no constraints on the CSs. If you have none of these 16s having a VEV, then you don't have to restrict the complex structure so that any of them are massless. So this is the thing that we wanted to split off and throw away. I'm actually going to keep it just for instruction. And then we have this. Okay, this may not be the most instructive thing in the world, but it is the equation for the interesting set. Right? This is the set where you can have a non-zero BM and a non-zero CS at the same time, and something interesting can happen. You can restrict yourself in complex structure, and this extra 16 corresponding to the non-zero BM can appear. So how are we going to find out from here where in complex structure space that occurs? Well, that's what elimination does. I have an equation in terms of two variables, BM, two types of variables, BM and CS, that tells me where in this combined, we call it bundle moduli space, in this combined 16 space and complex structure space, these solutions exist. If I just project it down onto the complex structure space, it will give me equations for the locus where these extra states, these extra 16s appear. So we just run it. OK, and another result. So these are the equations. So we had two pieces in our solution set. These are the projection of those equations down onto complex structure space. For the first one, any value of the complex structure was allowed because all the BMs were 0. And so it tells you the equation you need to solve to find an allowed complex structure is 0 equals 0. Right. Any complex structure is allowed if the BMs are 0. What this second thing is, is a choice of is a polynomial in the complex structure that describes, if you have your complex structure space, the moduli space of the Calabi-Yau, it describes some locus inside that. And on this locus, you can solve, this kernel condition can be solved. There's an extra element in the kernel. And an extra 16 pops into existence. Something's become massless. This is the locus where in my toy model, z goes to 0 and the mass term goes away. Okay. So let's have a look at that. We just use these two simple algorithms. That's all we used. We can just find a solution for the complex structure to those equations, just using find instance and Mathematica. Find, we had these conditions for the kernel. You can substitute in your complex structure choice. So we're just looking on this locus that we've found. I've just picked a point, and I've looked at the conditions for an element of the source to be in the kernel. There they are. And then we can just take our general kernel element and substitute in the solution and ask, on this locus in complex structure space, more specifically at this point I've chosen on this locus, what's in the kernel of this map? What's in the allowed 16? What's this new field that's appeared? And there it is. So this is a 1 over cubic polynomial that's appeared in the kernel of this map for this particular map, this particular special choice of complex structure. You can see that there's only one parameter left here, BM1. So there's only one degree of freedom. At this point in complex structure moduli space, this kernel, this cohomology has jumped by one. I don't know if I still have it. Yep. So what's happening, this is the sequence that describes our non-abelian bundle. If I chose a random complex structure off here, then you would find that these question marks are zero. And I had 18 families and, in fact, no antifamilies. What's happening here is if I go to this very special complex structure, I'm getting a one-dimensional kernel here. That means I have a one-dimensional co-kernel as well. These numbers are jumping. They're changing to 1. And now I have 19 families and one antifamily. Yeah? Can you find the solution for the complex structure now that you eliminated? Yeah, it's this. Well, you can write it down as an algebraic variety, right? You can never... You're not going to be able to. This is a like, uncomputed dimension and see where the bundle lies. Why don't we do that? OK, so this is the second part of the result. This is probably going to fail and you get to laugh at me, but why not? There's the second part of the result. Um, yeah, it's got all the variables. No, that's not the right one. Uh -huh. Oh, it's, I've already computed it. Cool. 
Um, the dimension has already been computed here. It's a 15-dimensional component of the complex structure space. In fact, I suspect it's... Uh, yeah. So the numbers here look like they go up further than that. What I did was I started with a general polynomial for the Klar BL before quotienting. And those numbers went from 1 to some 86, probably. bigger. Then I quotiented and I only kept some of them. So there's probably only actually 16 original complex structure variables. What this is telling you is, in fact, almost trivial result. It's telling you I've got one equation determining where in the complex structure space this jump happens. And so the dimension is 15. Again, using this Grobner basis thing, I said we could work out dimension. Yeah? Well, before your argument, though, I think you also mentioned before that there's a possibility that this is zero. Yeah, in, in some cases. But in, in, this isn't a general result. So we have that, that's actually wrong. This isn't a general result. So, for example, um, we have a case on this same manifold. If you do the Z3, Z3, you get left with 11 complex structure, and yet the jump takes you from 11 complex structure to just one left. Just yeah, that's right. But the same method here applies, right? Okay. Um, so I guess I will... Let's, yeah, you have to check that this Calabiao is actually smooth at this point. I did, it is. Okay. Um, so in general, what I'm trying to get at is when you write down these sequences, they look very, very abstract. It looks like you're making it up. It looks very weird if you've got a physics background like me. But in fact, all you're doing is polynomial calculations. You can do them in a very explicit manner. And when you do, you can get dependence in these equations. You can get interesting physics, jump in moduli space. You can do moduli stabilization effects with this kind of thing all just from a few simple techniques, which we saw at the start of the lecture, that allow you to efficiently manipulate polynomial equations. So just to, to sum up, what did we do in our three lectures? First lecture, algebraic varieties are really cool. They're quite um, a restricted set of the type of solutions we'd be interested in to preserve supersymmetry. But in lecture two, we saw that they're a restricted set where we can compute a lot. And in most of the other cases, we can't compute anything. And in lecture three, there are techniques that actually allow you to practically get your hands dirty and get in and do a computation. And that's it. So are there any questions? More questions? Hello. Uh, but in all these procedures, uh, the algebra is really cool. Uh, do you have at some point to assume which guys are parameters, like the VM, mm -hmm. which guys are variables in order to solve, where you can go with every single variable and you are able to, to eliminate uh, and to solve this Actually, as I, in terms of, if you wrote this in proper community layout, um, in terms of what I've been doing, I've been treating everything as a variable. I haven't been working with an extension of coefficient theory. But when you, so the, the question I guess is, when I do this elimination, am I free to choose which is my set Y and which is my set X? Am I choose, free to choose which I eliminate and which I keep? And it's completely your choice, you just specify. And in the algorithm, you just say, hey, I want you to get rid of this variable, this variable, and this variable. So you allow them for vanishing as well? Sorry? You allow them also for vanishing. For vanishing what? And, and you find them as variables, yeah. so then you lose those things can vanish. I mean, you can divide by them and whatever. The algorithm can divide by them. Yeah, I mean, it can eliminate them, or if they happen to be zero on the variety, that's not a problem. 